right here we are getting ready getting ready for thanksgiving break and uh here guys what pretty much the only break this semester right for you guys huh? perfect right at the end <laughs> and that's okay so um we'll be uh, probably finishing up chapter 10 today um so uh we'll just see and then uh we've got a couple of uh, you know, we'll do a review day or so, and then, you know, uh, we'll see what else you guys need. Um, but uh, don't forget, uh, the exam will be opening up tomorrow um, for you guys. It'll be online, kind of like what's been going on in the past, right? So same thing, you know, make sure you guys are, you know, have your work and upload that at the end there, that kind of stuff. Uh, chapter 10 is not on that exam, right? If you remember, I posted that for you guys so a week or so ago or something like that, right? You know, we're dealing basically... Um, what did it end up being? Chapter 6, 7, 8, 9. Part of 11. <laughs> and that one part of 11 there, right? So basically drawing a bunch of structures and interpreting what those structures mean and what information you can get out of it, right? And then chapter 10 will be on the final exam along with everything else, right? Sound good? Yeah. Yes? Does 6 start being not really spot on there too? Or not? Did, we, did, what, did we have part of 5? I can't remember. It was... I think that sounds familiar, right? But it's been it's been over a month. <laughs> I thought I don't think we had all of chapter five on exam two, right? So maybe the tail end of it there. But that sounds good. I should go back and ask some really hard questions about that. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, but anyway, so um, but yeah, so that, that'll be I'll open that up tomorrow morning, and then you guys will have you know a couple hours tomorrow to get that. Okay, good, all right. So um, we were making our way through the tail end of chapter 10 here. We basically just have one kind of idea left to go through. Um, and uh, then that'll, that'll kind of be it. Uh, this one idea kind of comes in two different parts and I'll kind of point out where the main, um, I guess, application to it comes from. Uh, but anyway, so before we uh, before we launch back into that, we'll, uh, we'll let's start with prayer again, and uh, then we'll, we'll pick it up. Um, but Lord, we just thank you yet again for another day and another blessing, and just another chance. Lord, uh, we just we just um, ask that you help us to remain humble today, Lord, and just to not forget the things that you've provided for us and the things that you've given us, Lord. Just help us to be good stewards of everything that you've given us, Lord, and just help us to share that with others in whatever way that it might be. And Lord, we just pray for an opportunity today to talk to someone else about you, Lord, in whatever way that might be, Lord, just to encourage someone to put them on the path or to just walk beside them, Lord, in whatever way that it is. We just pray that you put that in our way, Lord, and give us your words on our lips when that happens. We just pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So, we uh, ended on this... Uh, problem here where we kind of remembered a little bit of our stoichiometry and we brought in this idea of limiting reagents and reactants and all these kind of things, right? So remember, we spent a lot of time this semester dealing with solutions, right? And we learned about molarity and we learned about the different types of reactions and precipitations and redox and blah, 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 blah right? And that's kind of you know, the, the maybe a little bit more comfortable area for us to work in. But when we're dealing with gases, it's not really any different, right? The stoichiometry is still there. There's similar types of reactions, all this kind of stuff, right? And so we can have limiting reactant problems and limiting reagent problems and ask how much of a product gets made and how much of this is required, right? All these similar types of questions can apply to gases also, right? We just have to treat it a little bit differently Right? We have to figure out a way how to get gases into moles, right? but remember that's where our, our ideal gas law comes in also. right? Because remember, our, our ideal gas law has right, a value of moles in it. Right? So if we do need to convert something, we can use our ideal gas law. Okay? But there's other methods we can do also. right? <clears throat> so remember in here, uh, we were able to use our standard temperature and pressure and understanding that you know one mole of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure is 22.4, but remember that's only at standard temperature and pressure. Anything else, we have to use the ideal gas law, okay? All right, a little bit of a warm 
one up here. Here you guys go. types of problems, always pay attention to the units that things are in, right? Or as a measure of pressure. You can take a look, you'll need your gas constant in units of torque, which should be in your notes if you guys have it printed out. Or there's a thing called Google. That tells me. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard. It's in the notes. I know for 100% it's in the slide. Okay. This is a pretty big number. That was, okay. that was right there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I mean, if you think about it, right? Okay, I'm sorry. Geez, how much money do you think I made? <laughs> I'm sorry. We needed the Swissness directly from the Swiss. <laughs> Michael, how good is my homemade hot chocolate? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, well, 
I think we can start somewhere. So good. I like this. Right? Mm -hmm. That's we're giving uh, information about that, but we need information about this, right? But remember, so we have a container that this is all happening in, right? So we have a volume, right? Of uh, or we want to figure out the volume of this. Now you have moles of that. The temperature is going to be the same for everything. The pressure is going to be the same for everything, right? So as with all these problems, always list out all the um, the, the units that you have first, right? So if, um, no, you're going to need the ideal gas law. Yep. So you have pressure, you have temperature, you have moles, you have your constant, and you need to figure out volume is what it is. Uh, that might be the one equation I expect you guys to know. Yeah. Sure, P, pressure, P, P, volume equals N, moles, N, R, which is our constant, and RT, which is temperature, in Kelvin. Here we go. Uh -huh. All right. Cool. So, what is this problem asking us to do, right? So it says, right, we need to, we want to do this reaction, right? And we need to figure out the volume of oxygen. Right? We need to figure out volume of oxygen, but we're given moles of octane. Well, can we directly convert moles of octane into volume of oxygen? No, right? But as a big surprise, we probably have to do a mole-to-mole -mole conversion, right? If we have moles of octane, can we convert that into moles of oxygen? Yeah. What information do we need to con what information do we need to convert moles of one substance into moles of another? Our stoichiometry, right? Do we have a balanced equation? Sure hope so also, right? <laughs> I'm assuming I didn't make any mistakes with that, but hey, right? So now that we have our stoichiometry, we can convert moles of octane into moles of oxygen. So we can get that set up. So 10 moles of octane for every 2 moles of octane. 25 moles of O2. Right? And if we do that, uh, look, look, there I am. So 125, right? Moles of O2. That's a lot of moles. Why do I need this? Well, what am I trying to figure out? We're trying to figure out volume of a gas, right? O2 is a gas. How, what equation do I? What equation can I use to figure out volume of a gas? It's a secret equation that we use for every other problem in this chapter, right? It's our ideal gas law, right? PV equals nRT, right? PV equals nRT. Do I have information about pressure given to me? Well, that's right there, right? Okay, so I've got P. The question's asking me to figure out volume, so there's my question mark. Do I now have information about moles? That's right there, right? R is a constant, so we can always figure that out. And do I have information about temperature? That's got it? Remember, I'm always going to have to give you information about everything except for one part of this. Right? There's going to be one or two cases in the second semester of Gen Chem where you guys have to like solve multiple equations, right? Otherwise, it's always gonna be 
there's one thing missing, plug the rest in, right? The tricky part is just deconstructing what information you have. All right, so let's rearrange this, right? So volume is equal to MRT over pressure, right? So volume is equal to moles, which is 125 moles of O2, right? R62.36 liters uh, torr moles in Kelvin. Right, and 298.15 Kelvin. Don't forget to convert Celsius to Kelvin. And 752.4. Got it? If we plug that all together, we should get a pretty large number. 3,090.52. Sounds about right. So I got about 30, 90 liters of so remember, all we're doing here is I give you information about one of the reactants. We just use our stoichiometry to convert to the other and then use our ideal gas law. Okay? All right. Okay. A little bit trickier, but kind of the same idea here. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a hint. Probably have to use the ideal gas. I know. I'm feeling generous this morning. <laughs> The tricky part here is figuring out what in the world you need to solve your ideal gas law for, right? Well, we have this functional room. We don't have the moles. Mm -hmm. All right, so you have information about volume, you've got pressure, you've got temperature. Take a look in the, in the slides that I have for you guys. Okay. Or it's in the book. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't quite answer the question, yeah. right? So now we've got to think about what information we have and what we're trying to figure out. Right? So where do you do this from more than that?
part of the process. Right? So you have information about everything except for that. I would do it a different way, oh. right? Because let me see here. Let me think a little bit. Yeah, you could. Well, you need to know the density. Yeah. And I don't give you information about that. Yeah. Yeah. So you that you could do it if I had that, right? But the yeah. question is this. So, what what are the units for molar mass? Is it mm -hmm. So, do you have information about grams? Yeah. Yes. So, what do you need to figure out? What's the equation again? P equals what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a roundabout way, right? Um, but it's still, remember, it's just part of the equation, right? Okay. So if we just pull all the information out of the, um, the problem, right? I, you have information about pressure and volume and temperature. Your constants are constants. So the only thing you don't have is moles. Now, why in the world would we care to solve for the moles anyway? Because moles, we know how much moles are then we can use the, um, the weight Okay, so let me polish that statement. <laughs> You're absolutely right, but let me just let me just polish that statement by asking a question. All right, I'm asking you guys about molar mass. What are the units for molar mass? Grams per mole. Okay, if I give you any information in grams per mole, I'm giving you guys a molar mass. All right, so we have an unknown gas. Do you guys know how much that unknown gas weighs? Yes, right, I told you it weighs 1.13 grams. So now you have mass, so what do we need to figure out? Moles, got it? So we use our ideal gas law to figure out how many moles under these conditions, right? In this class, whatever you want to say. So PV equals nRT. So if we solve for N, right, we have pressure volume over RT, right? Then you guys can just fill in the appropriate, fill in the appropriate stuff there. And I got N is equal to 0.03533 moles. Good? So that's how many moles of that gas are in this container. So then we just take our grams, 1.13 grams per mole. And that is equal to about 32.0 grams per mole. This is a very rare and odd. O2. Yeah, that's probably our buddy oxygen, right? O2. Okay. So now I didn't ask you guys to identify the gas, but 
this is one of these questions that you, or how you could do it, right? The other way is with the density equation. If I give you information about mass and volume and all these kind of things, if you have density, you can back out the, um, the molar mass in that also. Got it? So what's the big secret to, the, uh, to these problems? The ideal gas law. The ideal gas law, and just write out what you guys have and what you're missing, right? Yeah, what's up? Um, where do you find the 1.13 grams? Uh, it's in the equation, in the problem up there. Oh, okay. Right, I tell you how much that weighs, right? Good? All right. Okay, so now we go into something that I remember was pretty confusing for me at the beginning. Um, but then I was like, oh, wait a minute. This, this, if I just think about it, this kind of makes sense. So we have sort of the idea of partial pressure, right? And uh, what it says is the total pressure of a mixture of gases is the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases in the mixture. And, okay, so what does this mean, right? If we've got a bunch of gases that are all mixing together, each of those are exerting a certain amount of pressure on their own, okay? Just like you guys have multiple classes, right? And some of those classes exert more pressure on you than others, right? But all the stress that you guys feel is a sum of all that different pressure. <laughs> That's what this is here, okay? The individual gases in a mixture each exert their own pressure. But the total pressure is just a sum of those individual parts. Does that make sense? Now, can you guys calculate individual pressures of a gas? Sure. What information do you need? Well, volume, right? Moles, temperature, right? And then you guys can calculate pressures. Got it? So the point being this, if I ask you guys for the total pressure of a system of multiple gases, you guys just solve the individual gas law equations for each of those gases in there. Got it? So you guys catch what I'm saying with this, right? We just find the individual pressure. So you do mm -hmm. multiple PV equals NRT equations. What's that? If you're being asked to find pressure, what constant do we use for specify that? Well, the constant is based off of what, I, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? Because okay. pressure is, you could measure in atmospheres or tors or millimeters of mercury, whatever it might be. Right, but you, you have to solve it in some value of pressure, right? Okay. Unless it's specified somewhere else. Okay. Good question. So that's all that this is talking about here, right? So this pressure plus that pressure when you mix it together is equal to 280, right? That's all, that's kind of the, uh, the, the visual of this. So everybody with me on that one, okay? So now we've got some scary equations and stuff. That's exactly what I'm trying to explain to you guys, okay? We have this idea of mole fractions, where if you figure out the fraction of gas one, right, the pressure of gas one is equal to that fraction of the total pressure. That's all this stuff is, is getting you guys to. So, right, the pressure of an individual gas is equal to the basically the fraction of that gas in the mixture. That's all it's saying. You guys are like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay. But all it is is a rearrangement and kind of solving out of the ideal gas law equations here, right? So you don't have to worry about writing this down or anything. All I'm saying is when we're talking about the individual sum of the pressures, they're just a fraction of the individual components there. But everything has to add up to be equal to 100%, right? So that's the kind of idea to keep in mind also. All right. So that all being said, right, that all being said, let's take a look at this. So we have a 500 milliliter flask, and I give you temperature and I give you pressure, and it contains some neon, right, and some, right, and I give you a value there, argon. And it's asking what the mass of the neon in the flask is, okay? Give you guys a second to kind of copy it down. What's 
millimeters of mercury to measure our pressure. Hmm? It's because of what they literally used to do to measure pressure is they have like basically moving mercury uh, barometers. Right, so how many millimeters it moved up or down, right? That, that's where it comes from. How do you convert from. that to a pressure we can use? Why can't you just use that one? <laughs> I mean, you can. You can convert it to whatever you want. I gave you guys a bunch of conversion plates. But... So what in the world is this problem kind of telling you guys here, right? So we've got a 500 milliliter flask. It's got two things in there. And I give you a measure of pressure, 750 millimeters of mercury. What is that 750? That's the what? Total pressure of everything, right? And a part of that pressure comes from the uh, neon, and a part of that pressure comes from the argon. Got it? So what are we trying to figure out? Well, we need to figure out the mass of the neon that's in there. And we have information about the total that's in there. Got it? No. So we have the pressure of the total, P total. We have information about the total volume. We have a to information about the total temperature, right? And we have information about what? The total moles. You guys catch what I'm saying with this? Here's what I'm saying. I follow, but I don't understand how we have we have P total, V total, right? R, we always have, and the total temperature, okay? Mm -hmm. And we can get N total out of this. You guys catch what I'm saying? How do we have N total? How? Because PV equals NRT. It only gives us one mass, though. I'm not, I, you're right. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not looking at the individual masses yet. What I do have information about is the total of everything that's in there. And what does that mean if I give you information about one of them? If you've got two total things and you know, or excuse me, if you've got two things mm -hmm. and then you've got the total, how can you figure out what the other one is? I decided to solve this in atmospheres. Oh, because I didn't give you information about that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. Okay, There's information fair missing. Fair enough. Let's do a quick conversion. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, where am I here? Okay. That was insanely hot. Well, I mean. Okay, I know I'm. I, okay, I've never been saying, but there's like a different level of like, what am I missing? I bet we could find a constant for millimeters of mercury all through it and look for it. But anyway, there we go. So we just do a quick conversion. All right. So do you guys catch what I'm saying here with this? Yes. Now we the have total the volume of our system is equal to the, excuse me, the total uh, number of moles in our system is equal to the sum of the individual moles. Got it? Yeah. Yeah. For the R can we just look that up? Yes. Yep. See what you guys come up with now. It's a constant. It doesn't 
doesn't necessarily mean it. Doesn't necessarily mean it. Do the constants reflect what pressure it's at, or is it just a constant? It's a constant. Okay. <laughs> right? It represents liters atmospheres over mole kilns. That's what it represents. It's not a, I don't know how to say it. It's not like something you could measure directly, right? It's something that's empirically derived, so to speak, right? You do a lot of different experiments and you back out the constant from it, right? If that makes sense. What's up? Yeah, just because I didn't give you guys information about the, the, the constant in millimeters of mercury. You could look it up. Oh. Yeah, if you found it, you could solve it the same way. Just for some reason, I didn't give it to you guys. So, I like the same. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, as long as you as long as you keep the units in this over here. We have the total moles of everything that's in there, right? I give you information about the mass of one of those parts. So what do you think we need to do? Hmm? Well, we need to convert two moles, right? Get this hammered out here then. 
So again, we have EV equals nRT, right? The total for everything. We're going to solve for n total, which is equal to uh, PV over RT. So just to write everything out, 0 0.9868 atmospheres, uh, volume of 0 0.5 liters. Make sure the units are all good. 0 0.08306 liters, atmospheres, one Kelvin, and 318.15 K. Okay. N total. So I got N total equal to uh, 0 0.01891 right? moles. Huh? Where's one? I mean, just a rounded thing. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So remember, this is equal to the sum of the individual moles. Now, what information are we giving? Well, I tell you what. The mass of argon. Can you guys convert mass into moles? Yes, I hope so, right? One of these key parts of Gen Chem 1. So 0 0.5 grams of argon, 39.95 grams for every one mole, equal to 0 0.0125 moles of argon. So if I take 0 0.01891 of the total moles minus 0 0.0125 moles of argon, I got about 0 0.00639 moles of neon. Everybody catch what I'm doing here. What's up? I think it's very Oh, good. <laughs> How do we know? How do we know? That, um, that there's exactly one mole of argon. We don't. There is not one mole of argon. There's 0. Oh, 0. I'm sorry. Of argon. Sorry. I, sorry. Brain not working. <laughs> you got it? Yes. Okay. And then we just do our final step. Moles of neon, convert moles back into grams. So for every one mole of neon, we have 20.179 grams, 0 0.253 grams, that's about what I got. All right. Whew. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry, why did you just do all that? <laughs> Good question, right? So remember, I'm getting I have my answer in mass of neon, right? And my question was asking what mass of neon is in the flask. Okay. The information that I'm given is based off of the total of the, the mixture of the two gases that are in there. The sum of the individual parts, right? That's what I mean by the total here. But when we're figuring that out, we're doing like argon, I think. Hmm? We're really solving for like argon. Correct, right? Because what we're figuring out here is the total amount in that flask. Okay. And the total amount in the flask is equal to the individual amounts that are in there. Oh, okay, I see. Got it? Yeah. It's tricky, right? Because there's a lot of different things we have to keep track of and conversions and everything. And that's why I keep pressuring you guys and asking you to just keep your units with you. I promise it's going to help you guys out. Otherwise, you just have numbers and you forget what they mean and this kind of stuff, right? Okay, yeah, we're gonna skip that. Oh, wait, can you go back up to this? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. We'll skip that one and we'll come back to it in Gen Chem 2. Bum, bum, bum. Dun, dun, dun. Or maybe later, I don't know. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> I don't want to 
want to scare you guys on a Monday is what it is. Hmm? You got it? All right. Okay, so now um, I, I like this problem uh, just because it actually is relevant. Um, to actually some of the research that we're trying to do here. But the idea is this, right? So um, if we try and, you know, gases are a byproduct of a lot of reactions that we do. And so if we try to measure our byproducts or is a reaction finished or how long does a reaction go or when do we know a reaction's done, right? We, it's not too easy to measure, you know, just by simply trying to trap a gas, like in a balloon or something like that, right? But if we just take and invert a graduated cylinder in a beaker of water, it's actually, that's usually how we measure how much gas comes out of a reaction. So it's a very low tech, but you know, accurate way of figuring out how much of a reaction gets finished, right? But there's something we have to think about here, right? Water has a vapor pressure, okay? No matter what the temperature might be, there's a little bit of the water uh, as a liquid escaping and turning into a gas. Right? And you, but you guys already knew that, right? That's why if you put a uh, beaker of water on your desk and you wait a while, it's going to slowly evaporate, right? Even though it's not boiling away, right? But the process of evaporation is turning a liquid into a gas, right? And so if I collect the gas over water, the total pressure that's trapped inside here, right, is equal to the pressure of the gas that we're collecting plus the pressure, the vapor pressure of water at that temperature. Got it? So I don't know if it's in this version of the textbook or not, but they used to have a table in the back of the textbook that says here are the vapor pressures of water at different temperatures. Okay? What's up? So what the reaction is being done in the in the graduated cell? No, no, no. We just have some reaction that's connected through that tube and it bubbles into there is what it is. Okay, so if you've got one of those like complicated like things that looks like the gym still from MASH and there's a tube feeding down and into the sure. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, but remember, this is just a specific application of the uh, the partial pressures. Can you guys figure out the partial? Uh, can you guys figure out the pressure of any gas? Yes. Sure. What do you need? Volume, temperature, right? Mold. PV equals nRT, right? Can you guys figure out the partial pressure of water? Well, sure. I can look it up, right? It's right there. <laughs> okay. Okay. What's up? Are you saying that? We're just saying if we're going through an assessing, right? The total pressure of this is equal to the individual pressures there. Right? If we just had like a pressure sensor, I would rather do it that way, but this is a perfectly fine way of doing it, right? Because what information do we get out of this? We get information about the volume of the gas that comes out, which we can then back into the pressure and then we can figure out moles and all that other kind of stuff from it, right? Pressure, it's not so easy to measure pressure unless you have very sensitive equipment, is kind of the other end of it. Okay. Okay. But everyone's got water in a glass tube, right? I don't have a glass tube. <laughs> I know what you guys are going to ask for Christmas. Okay. Wouldn't be the weirdest thing. You did tell us about your tank of healing, right? Actually, one, one Christmas, that was a birthday present. Oh, I'm sorry. One Christmas, my mom did get me a microscope, and the first thing I did was. I like pulled fleas off the dogs and stuck the fleas under the microscope <laughs> to see if there was bubonic plague in their gut, knowing there wouldn't be, but just hoping that maybe. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to segue from that one, but here's a problem. <laughs> that won't give you fleas. All right. <laughs> so we've got a so we've got a system here, and this is actually. Um, when we do want to generate oxygen in the lab, this is actually exactly what we do. Uh, we used to do an experiment like this. Um, wait a minute, do you guys do this still? Do you guys like, uh, are you guys the lab that they, you guys trap oxygen in the jars and you like drop like splints in there and stuff to see what color it burns? And, oh, yeah. Oh, you guys, you do or don't? No? We yeah. did do burning splints, but it okay. was yeah. something splints involving gas. Yeah, it was like involving like, Trying to figure out, yeah, the copper content or something. Oh, oh okay, you guys did that. 
Okay, so, but anyway, we used to do this experiment in the lab. You guys could trap oxygen and see, you know, the, the different um, colors that it can burn with different stuff in there. But anyway, so we take some uh, potassium chlorate there and we heated it up and 465 milliliters of oxygen was collected over water, right? So there's kind of the key to look for for these types of problems, okay? If they say something's collected over water, then we know we're gonna have to look up the partial pressure of uh, water at the temperature that we're collecting it, okay? So it says what mass of O2 was collected and it gives us the temperature and the pressure, okay? So we have pressure, we have temperature, we have volume, right? We have all these things there to go ahead and set up our ideal gas law in, right, in the, hang on a second, in the right way, okay? And what do I mean in the right way? Well, I mean in not the wrong way, right? Because remember, what are we saying here, right? P total, right, is equal to the pressure of oxygen plus the pressure of H2O, okay? You guys with me on this one? The individual pressures of the gases is equal to the total. So we need to figure out the pressure of O2, right? So P total, right? Minus PH2O, like it might an H, that would be useful. Which is equal to 750 millimeters of mercury. minus uh, 21.1 for the partial pressure of water, right? So if you guys go back, right? 21.1, 23 right there. Cool. And that is equal to 728.9 millimeters of mercury. Cool. Can we actually do anything with that? Yep, this is our pressure of O2. Yeah, but right? we can't convert that into anything usable. What do you mean? Convert it into atmosphere or total or whatever. We don't have a conversion for that. <laughs> okay, look it up. One, one millimeter of mercury is equal to one torr. Right? So 728 millimeters of mercury is equal to torrs. So it's 728.9 torrs? Mm -hmm. So TOR is basically just a measurement of mercury pressure. Sure, if you want to think about it like that. Who's the <laughs> Different applications, I guess, for different reasons. It's a good question. Why in the world do we have different measurements of pressure, right? That's kind of what you're asking. I don't have a good answer for you. I wish I had. I'm just a humble chemist. <laughs> I don't have those kind of answers to life. But don't worry, you can always look up a conversion. Okay, but we can just treat it as four. Sure. Or you can convert it to atmosphere by Google, do that's what we do. This is the partial pressure of water. Take a look on the previous slide I gave you guys that information. It's something you look up or something I have to give you information about. Right, that's the contribution of water at that temperature to the total pressure. Okay? What's the full pressure of water? I don't know what that means. Well, you said that's a partial pressure of water, so what's the full pressure of water? This plus that equals our total. This is the pressure that water is exerting at that temperature. So that is its full pressure, so to speak, right? So it's a big shocker. We have to do our ideal gas law again. So we have our pressure of O2, right? All right, we have our volume, 0 0.465 liters. Uh, temperature, we convert that into Kelvin. We pick whatever constant we want to work. Our 
pressure in moles and P equals N is what we're trying to figure out, right? It says what mass of O2 was collected. We can calculate moles of O2 and then moles of O2 into grams of O2, right? rush things along, but I do want to just wrap this up today, so I'm going to just kind of give you guys the answer here. So P, V over R, T, right? Just rearrange the gas law, and I got N equal to 0 0.01836, right? That's our moles of O2. 0.36 moles of O2. Oops, I got that reversed. One mole of O2, 32.0 grams, so 0 0.588 grams of O2. All right. Look for that clue there about something was collected over water. Then you're going to have to get uh, information about the partial pressure of water at that temperature. And then you guys can move from there. Okay? Thank you, All right, so real quick, as I promised, right? We've been dealing with ideal gases. Now, how many gases actually behave in an ideal way? In reality, there's not too many of them, right? But, you know, for the, usually for the pressures and the temperatures that we work, or at least I work at, you know, we can assume that they're ideal, right? But, um, the Van der Waals equation here is kind of what we end up using when we have non-ideal gases, right? So there's a couple of corrections in here, right, in terms of finite volume and things actually are talking to each other, right? You do have intermolecular forces and there are values and all that stuff that kind of comes in there, right? And we, you can even expand this out and there's more complex corrections that we can add into these things depending, right? But you guys can see the individual parts in here, right? P and V is equal to N and R and T, right? So, but we just have to put corrections on the pressure and the volume, right? Because these are the things that are actually going to be changed, the volume and the pressure change depending on what the gases are, right? Temperature is not gonna change, moles not gonna change, a constant's a constant, right? But if you start to have um, uh, gases that interact with each other, Right, then the pressure and the volume are going to change also is what it is. And so that's why those corrections get added onto that. Right, so I think they give you an example in the book about they tell you what all these different values are and this kind of stuff and they make you work it through. Okay, right. <clears throat> the point being, right, you just have to be given information about this kind of stuff. And in reality, things aren't always ideal, but I didn't probably have to tell you guys that either. Right? You guys are all adults and understand this. Okay. okay? But we do have ways of modeling it, and we do basically take these corrections out with the assumptions that we make to make an ideal gas. That's all it comes down to. Okay? All right, fantastic. So that's the end of chapter 10. Uh, keep an eye out for that exam tomorrow, right? And then um, Wednesday and Friday, uh, we'll be uh, doing whatever review that you guys want. So come with any questions that you might have. Huh? Is that the last question? No, we still got Wednesday Thursday. I mean Wednesday Friday. Well, does it end it? No. I thought we ended at 10. Okay. Yes. Did you do it? Yeah. yeah. So Thursday, we're not busy. Wednesday and Friday is just going to be like reviewing it? Yep. Cool.